and greetings everybody welcome to our next presentation which is on Italy in the 14th century and this is the time period where we begin to talk about the Renaissance and the Renaissance comes to us the name itself comes to us from the Italian word Renascimento which means rebirth and that is exactly what this time period is about it is the rebirth or reemergence of both art and science as we are emerging from the dark or middle ages and again it is a time that we see a tremendous development in not only the arts but also the sciences the Renaissance occurred between the years 1300 and 1600 and as with really any dates there's some variants here. We might say that there's some Renaissance works that begin as early as the late 1200s. We might even say that the Renaissance officially ends more toward 1573. But the years 1300 to 1600 give you a broad idea of when this occurred. The time period for today's lecture is the 1300s, the Trecento period. Um, most of us call it the early Renaissance, but there's other names to describe this time period. So you may hear it called the Proto-Renaissance or even the Late Gothic, and all of those are really correct. In our next lecture, we're going to be talking about the 1400s, which is the Middle Renaissance, and a couple lectures from now, we're going to cover the 1500s, which is called the Late or High Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance itself occurred all over Europe, even up in England. But the most incredible works that we really focus on emerged from Italy. In fact, about 80% of the Renaissance art occurred in Italy. Now, we're going to be covering four major cities. Today, we're going to focus on the city of Padua, which is right up here near... Venice, just to the left of Venice. In our next lecture, we're going to be down in the Republic of Florence. During the 1500s, we'll focus on Rome and the Vatican. And then after the sack of Rome in 1527, we'll be back up here in the city of Venice. So who is involved with the Renaissance itself? This is an era where some of the greatest individuals that have ever walked the earth are living and working. Some of the people we know immediately, such as Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. The third great artist of the Renaissance is Raphael. And in, next, in the next lecture, we'll look at the sculptor Donatello. So just in the first group here, we've covered all the Ninja Turtles. We're also going to look at the painter Botticelli. In religion, we have Martin Luther. In politics, Machiavelli. Adventurers such as Christopher Columbus and scientists such as Galileo are all active during this time period. Now, a lot of people ask, like, you know, hey, if you had a chance to go back in time in a time machine, would you go to the Renaissance? And the answer is absolutely not. It is so much more wonderful to be living in today's time and reading about what happened during the Renaissance. It was not a particularly wonderful time to be alive. Europe and the countries within it don't exist as they do today. The borders um, were much different, and particularly when we look at Italy, as you saw in the previous map, it's really comprised more of a loose association of city-states, and a lot of times they're battling one another. We have a male-dominated society. In fact, when we look for female artists, many of the times we're not going to find any until the late 1500s or early 1600s when they rise to prominence. We're going to have religious persecution, constant warfare, famines, floods, and most importantly, disease. 
during the Renaissance, we're going to see the plague strike several times. And the plague, sometimes called the Black Death, uh, is going to devastate the Renaissance. It occurs about every 10 years, but every century or so, there's a major outbreak. The first major outbreak came in 1348, when half of the population of Europe is killed. In the city state of Florence, it's much worse. Nearly 80% of that city's population is killed off. And the plague strikes very, very quickly. You're looking at waking up in the morning and feeling just fine, maybe not so good around noontime, and you don't even have to bother with dinner because you're going to be dead. That's how quickly the plague strikes. And you'll see, when you look through books, particularly on the Italian Renaissance, you'll see these wonderful artworks being created by artists you may not have heard of before. And you want to look and see what other works that they did. And unfortunately, they didn't do anything because in 1348, most of them were killed off. So it did really hamper the artistic uh, prominence of this time period. We even have artwork such as The Triumph of Death that relate the issues that we have with the plague. In the lower left-hand corner of this painting, we see people laid out in coffins, victims of plague. Here's a more detailed image of it. And this is a, a work that is on the outside of a building called the Campo Santo. And it was destroyed. Uh, most of this is on the outside of the building uh, in a walkway area, and there was uh, some covering on top of it. The covering caught fire. Uh, the flames got so hot that the paint melted off of the walls. Uh, since, and this is around the 1940s, I believe, and since then, major restoration effort for the last 60, 70 years has replaced most of the artwork on these walls, but it is still a continuing effort. Over at the Church of Santa Trinita, we have one of the first important altar pieces that we're going to look at, which is the Madonna and Child Enthroned by Chimabui. And since we're going to be looking at a lot of altar pieces in this course, I really want to delve into how they were created. So we're going to first look at dissecting an altar piece here. Now, the first layer signified by the letter A, is the wood that is used to create the altarpiece. And the wood that's normally used is poplar. Level B is a gesso layer, and there are several layers uh, placed on the wood to make the wood um, smooth enough to to paint on, you can think of gesso as kind of like a priming agent. It's actually a mixture of like plaster and glue or chalk and glue. And not only is it a smooth surface, but also a, a very luminescent surface. So you would have several layers of this applied once it dries, it's sanded because gesso does dry fairly rough, very similar to sandpaper and uh, then that process is repeated several times. Level C is the underdrawing, the idea of what we're going to have here as our image. Level D is the gold leaf that is attached. E is the grisaille or gray values. Uh, it's uh, how light or how dark an object is going to be. And then the completing, completed painting is going to be completed with using tempera paint. And one of the reasons that we use tempera paint during this time period is because oil paints that we're a lot more familiar with haven't quite been invented yet. Now this is tempera paint that you would buy today at an art store. Uh, it's not quite uh, what they use during the Renaissance, but 
for this uh, explanation it is, and this is tempura. So you have to be really careful with how you spell tempura because many times, and uh, probably as well with the spell check, it will change it to tempura. So you do want to be careful. You don't want to make your teacher hungry when he is reading your papers about using tempura paint. So tempera is created, and this is traditional tempera, not the poster paints that we would buy today, are created with pigment and egg yolk. Tempera has been used uh, as a painting medium since the late Roman Empire, and we see this particularly used on the illuminated manuscripts. We do paint this on wood panels. Again, uh, poplar wood is used and then treated with gesso, as you see in the image below. And here we have a couple of the altarpieces in situ, which is a Latin phrase, uh, which basically means that these are in their original locations. Most of the altarpieces that were created during the Renaissance now reside in museums or galleries or even private collections, and very few of them are still in their original location, and it is definitely uh, a treat to see them where the artist had intended uh, for them to go. Now, another altarpiece that's going to be really important is the Madonna and Child Enthroned, this time by the artist Giotto. And we look at Giotto as one of the very first, if not the first, uh, Renaissance artist because his art is so incredibly different than Cimabue's. Now, here we have the altarpiece in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And you can see how massive this artwork is. It's about 10, 10 and a half feet tall. You can see it uh, compared to the doorway that we would pass through uh, at the lower right hand side of the screen. Now, placing them next to one another is really important. As an art historian, we love to compare and contrast objects to put them into context. And the work at the left, again, Enthroned Madonna by Cimabue, work at the right, Enthroned Madonna by Giotto. And we do have a relationship that is formed between these two individuals. Um, Cimabue is the teacher of Giotto. And in the book called The Lives of the Artists by Giorgio Vasari, we actually have the relationship uh, that's told to us about how Cimabue is out in the walking through the fields of Tuscany and he comes across this young boy drawing with incredible accuracy and the two begin to talk and Giotto ends up going to work for the workshop of Cimabue and he's trained as an apprentice. There's about 20 years of time span between these two works so what you would really want to do at this moment is go ahead and stop the video and write down some of the differences that you see between these two works because they are extremely different and they're a very important comparison. So after you've taken some time now and looked at these two works, I want to highlight just a couple of different things with these paintings. Again, they're done about 20 years apart. The work at the left is very representational of the late Gothic or Byzantine type of artwork, where it's very flat, two-dimensional, it's very frontal. It almost looks like the Madonna is going to slide off of the throne. Over at the right, there is a lot more space. It's not quite three-dimensional. We do have a little bit of stacking, uh, as you see with the saints or angels at the left and right side of the Madonna, but not as dramatic as we see in the work at the left. When we look at the angels and all the figures at the left, 
we can see that they're looking all over the place. They're not really concentrated on the Madonna as we see in Giotto's work. And line of sight is one of the most important ways of creating emphasis or creating a focal point in a painting. And Giotto does that perfectly. We also have accessibility. The Mad Madonna would have to step over the individuals in the bottom of the painting to get to us. But in Giotto's work, we have a, a pathway right up to the Madonna. And finally, we want to apply the term mimesis here. Mimesis means to mimic or it means to replicate. And in this case, we are replicating nature. And that's extremely important because during the Renaissance, artists are interested in reproducing the real world. And with that, the better you're able to recreate what the world looks like, the better the artist you're going to be, the more commissions you're going to get, the more famous you are going to be. So mimesis is a really important characteristic of Renaissance art. Now this is the Arena Chapel in Padua, and this is where we have the best remaining works of the artist Giotto. And this was painted, these works are going to be painted around 1305. The Arena Chapel is called that um, just because it is created, uh, built on the grounds of an ancient Roman arena. So this is an inside image of uh, standing at the very entrance into the Arena Chapel. There's approximately 37 separate images. Uh, the lower images that are just kind of uh, black and white, uh, those are images of the seven vices and seven virtues. Up above that, we have the life of Christ. Up above that, the life of Mary. Now, when we're standing at the altar and looking back toward the entrance hall, um, we see the Last Judgment, and we're going to focus on that in a later image. We'll look at some of the details. So, when we look at the meeting of Joachim and Anna, this is a work that is leaps and bounds ahead of where we were just a few short years ago with the late Gothic or Byzantine types of art. Again, it was an artwork that was very flat, very frontal, and we don't really have characters that even acknowledge each other's presence, although they're standing right next to one another. When Giotto comes around, all of a sudden we have characters that interact, and in this case are showing emotion. Now, it's not at all saying that Giotto's works are perfect. By far, they are not perfect, uh, particularly when we look at uh, the architecture here. It looks a little silly. It's out of proportion. We still have a, a very much a flatness to the work. You know, it's about 100 years from now uh, until we figure out linear perspective. But we also have uh, a lack of a light source. Everything is equally bathed in light. And we don't have any shadows, not from the building or any of the individuals. So we still have a way to go uh, with the development, at least technically, of art. And we'll take a look at a few of the more famous images from the Arena Chapel here. The Adoration of the Magi uh, is a great image because that Star of Bethlehem up above is a rendering of Halley's Comet, which is passing the Earth in 1305. We have the Kiss of Judas, which has a tremendous amount of textiles and, again, interaction of characters. We have a lot of weapons being waved up above. The Crucifixion, the Lamentation, and finally, the Last Judgment. And the detail at the right shows the owner of the Arena Chapel, which is Enrico Scrovini, offering it to the Virgin Mary. And it's basically his way 
of buying entrance into heaven. And during this time, that was totally acceptable. Um, it would be very much like buying an indulgence from the Pope himself. But Enrico Scrovini committed the sin of usury, and he needed to atone for that sin, and that's why the Arena Chapel was built. Giotto painted it and dedicated it to the Virgin Mary. Now, it's not uncommon for the patron, the one who's paying for the work of art to be produced, to be in the artwork itself. And many times, we'll also see the artist painting himself in works of art. Now, the Arena Chapel is not painted in tempera. It's actually painted in fresco. And sometimes you may even hear the term buon fresco, although it's very rare. Most of the time, we just call it fresco painting. Fresco is the Italian word for fresh, and it refers to the plaster that's being applied to the wall. Now, this is a really great way of painting because what happens, and uh, the artist here is showing a spolvero or cartoon, which is what we're going to, it's a way of transferring the image from the paper to the wall, and it gives you the outline of what the artist is going to paint. Once the transfer of the image is complete, uh, you're going to have, you're going to start painting it. And here, the pigments that we use are emulsified in lime water and then applied to the wall. Now, the great thing about fresco is that once the plaster dries, and it takes about 12 hours, the paint becomes part of the wall and it's going to last as long as that wall or ceiling does. So this is very much a long-lasting type of painting medium. When you go to the Sistine Chapel, that looks as beautiful today as when Michelangelo painted it 500 years ago. So a couple things you need to know about fresco is that, first of all, fresco is painted during the warm summer months so that the plaster will dry correctly. As with any type of painting, we want to paint from the top down to prevent dripping on sections that are already complete. Unfortunately, there is a limited color palette that we can use because not all pigments are water soluble. And finally, fresco painting is not only slow, it has to be very methodical. A full size figure would take about two days to paint at a very rapid pace. So you can see and imagine how slow that you would be working in this type of medium. It's also fairly dangerous. You can see the individual here up on scaffolding. And a lot of times with fresco painting, you may be painting an altar wall 40 feet high or a ceiling 50 feet high. And you have to be very careful because our natural inclination is once we paint something, we take a step back, admire the work, look at it, make sure it looks correct, and it can you can easily fall. In fact, that's what happened to Michelangelo when he painted the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. He fell off of the scaffolding. He was okay, but when we have some other artists, such as Barna de Siena, who we really don't hear a lot about because he died from the fall that he had while painting this image at the right. You'll also hear the term fresco seco. And the difference between the two is that fresco seco is painted on plaster that has already dried. And it is not going to be anywhere near as permanent. So why would you paint in fresco seco? Um, because what you're going to end up with is an image perhaps like this. Now, The Last Supper was not a true fresco seco painting, but I wanted to show you the degradation that can happen to paint uh, over a period of time. And we'll talk about The Last Supper in a subsequent lecture. And only about 25% of this painting remains. In fact, it's said that most of the paint here are from restorers rather than da Vinci's own hand.
but reasons you would do or use fresco seco uh, if you made a mistake maybe painted six fingers on a hand of an individual you would uh, instead of chipping the paint out reapplying the plaster painting that section again which is what you should be doing you might paint over it or if you're up against a deadline and traditional fresco painting is going to be too slow for you to complete that image by the deadline you know you might consider fresco seco and figuring that a lot of these paintings are so high up in space that you may not the person may not realize it's fresco seco for 20 40 50 years and by then you're long gone so fresco seco was something that was done occasionally sometimes to kind of cheat the system where traditional fresco wasn't possible um, but other times you know as in the case here um, this was really kind of a, a very large a 15 foot by 30 foot oil painting on top of a plaster wall and I think if da Vinci really knew the uh, long-reaching effects of this painting I think it would have been done in fresco but then again da Vinci wasn't trained in fresco painting and and that is uh, a topic for a later lecture so we need to talk about art and, and who's producing art during the Renaissance well first of all we have a category of wealthy families and art is not like it is today if we wanted a painting today uh, we'd go online we'd go to a store we would purchase it um, sometimes we would contract with an artist but the whole idea is that paint uh, and other forms of art are readily available today and they're somewhat um, economical for us to buy but back in the Renaissance that wasn't the case art was very very expensive so we have really uh, very wealthy families such as the Scrovinis who we just saw Enrico Scrovini and his building of the Arena Chapel the Albizzi family the Strozzi's the Brancacci's and most importantly, and we'll talk about them in several lectures, is the Medici family. Then we have the church, led by the Pope, and particular ones that were involved with art would be Benedict the Twelfth, Clement the Sixth, Innocent the Seventh, Leo the Tenth, who was a member of the Medici family, and we also have the person at the right, who is Julius the Second. And he is uh, responsible for uh, a rebuilding of St. Peter's Cathedral. He is the Pope that brought Michelangelo down to paint the Sistine ceiling. And he also brought Michelangelo to paint his personal apartments, particularly the library, where we have a wonderful fresco series that includes the School of Athens. We also have the guilds, which are independent associations of bankers, merchants, artisans, manufacturers, uh, basically any job that you had in Florence or in Italy during this time was overseen by a guild. Uh, for instance, if you were a painter, you would be in an apothecary guild, whereas sculptors would be in the stonecutters and masonry's guild. Uh, they're very similar to today's labor unions and again luckily for us they were extremely competitive so if there was an art competition each guild would try to outdo another guild by hiring a more uh, expensive or well-known artist or using more expensive materials to show that they really are the more powerful guild and finally we have civic bodies and Civic bodies are not as frequently as used as other different patrons that we've seen, but they do produce art. For instance, at the right, we have the Palazzo Vecchio, and we have the statue of David right at the base. Now, this is not the original one today, but this is where the statue of David was originally set uh, before it was moved to the academy where it is today. But originally it was going to go on the Florence Cathedral and when it was unveiled people thought it was so beautiful they put it 
right outside the government building in Florence. And in that area, this is a place where people would congregate. So it was on display to the public. Now, we also have across the way in the city of Siena, uh, the Palazzo Publico. And you can see that uh, both buildings are very, very similar in their construction. In fact, when we look at the Palazzo Vecchio, uh, we see that we have crenellations on top. We have no windows on the ground floor, very warlike time. The tower, approximately 300 feet in height, uh, used as a jail, but also used as an indication of where the city was. If you were a pilgrim traveling throughout Italy, you might cross over a hillside and see this in the distance and know which direction to take to the city of Florence. But when I bring this image up here of the Siena government building, there's another artist there that we need to be familiar with, and that is Duccio. And Duccio was the Giotto of his city, a groundbreaking artist. Again, lots of these artists produced altarpieces. That was very, very common. But we really want to focus on the altarpiece that he created for the Siena Cathedral. And if you ever get a chance to go to this cathedral, it is absolutely stunning because on the inside, they use striped marble. The altarpiece that was placed here was placed in this location in the center of the church. And so it was viewed by both sides or from both sides. It was called the Maesta. And the Maesta took um, Duccio about three years to create. And once it was created, uh, the city closed down for an entire day so that everyone could attend um, basically a parade, taking the altarpiece from Duccio's studio over to the Siena Cathedral, and it, it was an incredible event. Unfortunately for the Maesta, it didn't stay that long. Uh, it was taken down in 1506, and within half a century from that, no one could tell you where it was. It was found in 1771, but at that time it was dismantled and sold off. And that's something that we see very, very frequently. Um, if you go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., they own three of the panels. So many of these panels are artist reproductions. Some of the originals are put back into place. And to give you an idea of how large this altarpiece is, just that center panel of the enthroned Madonna is about seven and a half feet tall and about 14 feet wide. So it's a very large work. This is the front and then we have the back side as well. I think there's about 40 different scenes that come together to make up this altar work, altar piece. And a couple of the panels. We can see the difference between Duccio's and Giotto's rendering of the raising of Lazarus. There's also some terminology in this chapter I want to go over just so that you're familiar with it. The first is an illuminated manuscript, which is simply a heavily decorated page of religious text. It's something we see very frequently from about the 5th century AD right on through the 1400s of the Renaissance time. And it may have taken monks, and these were made in monasteries and in places called scriptoriums. You might have a, a crew of four or five individuals working on this. Um, most of the time it was monks because uh, they were educated. And it may have taken a month to complete one of these uh, images, the image at the right, uh, is a work from the Lindisfarne Gospels. We've covered altar pieces today. When we see a two-paneled work such as this, this is a diptych, fairly rare. 
triptychs are very, very common, and this is really what we're going to see for the next couple of chapters in our text. It is a three-paneled altarpiece, and most of the time today, you would see this in the open position because this is where really the most famous work is. When you close the altarpiece, which is how during the time period that this would have been in a church, um, you would have had a different image on the surface uh, of the closed panels. And this would have only been open, for instance, on Sundays or on uh, particular festival days or holidays. A polyptych, like the Maesta, is a multi-paneled altarpiece. We talked about tempera paint. We did not talk about hieratic scale, though, or sometimes it's called hierarchical scale. And this is where we have an uh, individual, in this case the Madonna, uh, as supersized. I mean, she's uh, two to three times as large as anyone else's here in this image, and she's sitting down. You can imagine how uh, gigantic she would be if she stood up. And again, this is a way of indicating the emphasis or focal point of the work by placing them or supersizing them um, in heretic scale. Mimesis, to mimic or to reproduce, and remember we're reproducing nature during this time period. So I'll see you next time for our lecture of, of art in Italy during the 15th century.